Are you saying help? it's almost impossible for a man, a young boy who's hurt, to heal without another man initiating him? You got me, man. What you got another one? I mean, like. <laughs> is deep. You're so unique. You got to find the truth underneath. So let's There's there's a pain from a father that cuts deep like nothing else, man, to the soul and heart. And so man, I'm so glad we're going to talk about this with you on a personal level but then also on a professional side. What was your relationship with your dad like growing up? My mom and my dad uh, were together. A lot of uh, turmoil, and they got divorced, I think, when I was around five. And so after that, I remember it just being one of those weekend things, and he wasn't really in my life consistently. In fact, I had a lot of uncles. Uh, my grandfather on my, my dad's side, his father actually, was very much in my life. And so I just remember always feeling like, okay, he's my dad, but there was just, it was weird even to call him dad. Um, I, what, what I do now is I actually call him pops. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why there, that helps. I don't know what that does, but it helps me to sort of attach to that a little bit more. But uh, just growing up, man, it was very, and there's so many layers to it, but very inconsistent. And um, I remember I just, I, I felt like an outsider even when I went to his home. Obviously, you know, when he, he had his own place and all that. Um, but yeah, I just, it, it was very inconsistent and I definitely yearned to be closer to him. Um, but it felt weird. So it's kind of this, this feeling that kind of had a couple of things attached to it. Jack, did you feel a hole in your heart, in your mind? Like, man, I know that I feel like there's something missing or, you know, when you became a teenager, was it like, hey, I'm old man. Can you talk about what does it feel like not to have a dad as a teenager? So a great example, so I, I work kind of through examples. Uh, you know, one is Boy Scouts. I remember, so let me, let me add the cultural component in with it. Um, I, was, I went to white schools. My mom wanted to make sure we, we went to good schools. So that naturally meant that we were in predominantly white neighborhoods, mm -hmm. suburban, if you will, America. So I was already an outsider from that perspective. I already felt at a deficit when it came to all the kids who had dads and moms and they went to basketball games and they brought food and all just the, that, that kind of wholesome whole home. Um, and so for me, it, I was, I was constantly, I feel like surrounded around wholeness and I, I felt very much fractured. And so I grew up just always wanting what all my classmates had, my teammates had, I grew up with that yearning of, I want that. And um, I remember, so Boy Scouts were the place where I kind of was able to, to kind of get some of that from, from dads who, you know, obviously didn't look like me, but they were willing to, to be mentors. <clears throat> I remember we had these derby cars made of wood and you, you basically take a block of wood and you fashion it. Well, I turned up at the Boy Scout meeting with this sort of misshapen car. Um, it kind of was painted and it just, it still needed things. It's the ones that you put the CO2 cartridges in yeah. and basically just like explode off. So really cool, real, real cool project that we were doing, but all the other fathers and their sons were kind of just around. And I remember I had this, I, I was, it was pretty much just me. Um, I think I'm a scout leader there, but I was this, you know, just boy kind of sitting there and, you know, you know, there would be a father who would come over. I think maybe he felt bad and he'd try to help me or whatever. And then he'd have to go off because this, it was his son's turn. And I think it was one of the, I didn't even register right how profound that was for me, but also for, for other people there. Um, but that, that's a great example of just that profound feeling of like, there's loss and then lost. Right. So just lost. I mean, that, that's, that's probably what characterizes my, my kidhood. Hmm. At what age, at what point did you start being able to really identify these feelings and thoughts and maybe start to do, try to get help for it from it? Two ages. Uh, one was at 12, 13 years old, and the other was around 18, 19 years wow, old. Pretty, yeah. I think are pivots. Very much. Very much pivots in a young man's life. 12, 13 years old, that's like the, man, I don't even know what to call it. That's, that's the age of becoming. Right. Um, I remember I was in the car with my mom, 
and all those feelings started coming up. And I remember for some random reason, I just broke down and I talked about how I don't have a dad and he's not in my life. And I remember my mom then broke down and started crying and just like, well, what do you want me to do? And she just felt helpless. And so obviously oftentimes when we feel powerless is when we feel angry. I mean, it's kind of that natural cousin to feeling powerless in terms of feeling state. But um, that's when it really became, I mean, we can become aware and then we become sore. And that wound really started feeling sore. Um, and then 18, 19 years old, I had some brothers in the church, amazing brothers, Jermaine Peacock, Charlie Sawyer, man, those guys are amazing. They are. You know them. Yes. Yeah, they were like, man, we really want to help you uh, with this. Let us help you with this. And I think I still was scared, fearful. Yeah. Scared like of what? Sorry to interrupt. Scared yeah. of love, scared of trust. What was that fear? Well, I had a girlfriend at the time, and the best distraction for fatherhood issues are having a girlfriend. Even even as a disciple, even as someone of man of faith, right? Yeah, I, we got to yeah. unpack that. Don't let me forget, we got to unpack that a little bit, like yeah. the from that pain. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they, so these two guys confront your fear to love, trust. What was that tipping point that helped you? Like, all right, I'm gonna open up again. Well, it was a process. I mean, I think uh, the heart hardens in layers, but it also is healed in layers. Um, my college time was really the period where that happened. It was, I mean, it's a process, not an event. Mm -hmm. From my, you know, I, w I went to JUCO for three years and then I went to UMKC. Uh, that whole time, different stages of it were worked through. I, I use like Wild at Heart. I mean, that's what was available at the time. You know, John Eldridge's Wild at Heart. That's probably fantastic. Yeah, really. huh? Love that book. Yeah. Yeah, I use that as a film. I mean, you know, I use that. That was like a, a manhood Bible in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, that, that was a lingo that caught for sure um, on. And, but really, I have to, I mean, I'll probably this one, this, this piece where I really confronted it was a conversation with my dad. We'll probably get to that a little bit later, but that was a profound piece that don't, don't let me forget about that piece where I, I talked to my father. Yeah. If we can sh shift a little bit here to now yeah. tap into your professional skills here as a counselor, yeah, yeah. When, even as a dad. So when you look back through the lens of a counselor, look back at the lens of a father, when you look at yourself or for any child that doesn't grow up with a dad, like, would you classify that as trauma or how uh, what, you're nodding your head. So I'm guessing yes. <laughs> yeah. So can you define trauma for all of us? And like why growing up without a dad would be traumatic. There's different types of trauma. There's different parts of trauma. The thing about trauma is it, it's about the brain wanting conclusion, but not being able to have it. You know, the brain wants to create a beginning, middle and an end to everything that we experience. So what our brain does when we, when we experience something is it creates the beginning and the middle, but what trauma interrupts is it creates that conclusion or that resolution. What our brain does is it just fills it in. So it'll fill it in with a, a very uh, disaffirming narrative, like I suck. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't good enough for my dad to stay. It'll fill it in. And the problem with that is, okay, you have conclusion, but you don't have truth and there's no way to get healing um, with that. So as a result of it being trauma, it is, it leaves a lack of conclusion that endures. I mean, we're, we're talking about somebody being, well, set up for chronic disappointment in life. I mean, it's a huge attachment injury. I mean, you see it even, you know, both parents, I'll just start there for a moment. I work, you know, I work with folks who've been adopted and so forth. And, um, it's an attachment injury. It's, there's a lot of questions, you know, it, when your father, your mother, well, when your father's not there, there's some analogous acid aspects to it that are similar to adoption. You have very similar questions and it, it's, it interrupts the narrative of where do I belong and why was I given away? Why wasn't I claimed, which is a big piece in the adoption piece. Um, but that claiming is so important. That's actually how we develop without that we miss developmental milestones. And those milestones are, are, are very um, difficult because we, we, we look at milestones, how people are developing kids, you know, how they doing in school, how they doing in sport, how they externally. But we don't really look at milestones in terms of emotional and spiritual milestones very well at all in kids, like hardly at all. 
-hmm. So kids are missing that when a father's not in their life. And then that starts to get filled in with lust, with pornography. It starts to get filled in with drugs, whatever it is. But the problem is, is that, you know, obviously when that trauma happens, we still, what, pe what people need is they need a, a sense of conclusion. They need a narrative that's true and that's functional for them. And so that's what's missing. That's what people seek. And that's what I saw as well. I wanted to, I, it didn't make sense. The story didn't add up. Yeah. And I think we can go back to what you discussed about distractions. Like, I love what you said there. What are some ways that you found that people want to fill that void, want that, hey, I'm worthy, I'm loved, I'm special, but they're filling it in the wrong way. Where do you usually see people go? Let me go brain science for a moment. Our brain, uh, in a way, part of our brain could care less where uh, the, the good feeling comes from. When you look at something like dopamine, dopamine, you know, it's rewarding. It's, it reinforces a behavior. Something like adrenaline gets us like aroused, right? It's like, oh my goodness, I feel alive. Then there's oxytocin. Oxytocin is the cuddle chemical, right? It's what binds us to something. It's really important in terms of attachment. What you find for people is they find replacements for what they don't get from the relationships that they should have. So if I don't have a father in my life, you think about what a father represents. A lot of times a father represents a playmate. He represents someone who's going to take you on a thrill. He's strong. He can put you up. He can do a lot of things. And when you think about how your brain works, when you don't have those things, you're, you're talking about missing those things. That's one thing. It's another thing if now I don't know how to get that without going about a bad way to get it. I mean, it, it's really difficult to find a father who has time to be another, to be a father for someone else other than his family. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you think about oxytocin, um, it's that, that idea of God is put in our brains, the ability to attach. If that's not there, I'm going to form, I'm going to find a way to fill a tax, usually to things, because I can control things better than people or people and I can get more from people than I get from things, but I'm still going to do it in a way where in uh, it's I'm not going to know how to be vulnerable, and and that's that's a big part that's also missing too. Is is I've been so hurt, and it creates kind of we'll talk more about this that destructive entitlement, and that's what empowers addictions. That's what empowers sin. Even is that I got screwed over by my dad not being here, so I deserve this. Right. I, I, where, where's mine. And then we have certain parts of the brain that help that as well. You know, the, when you look at how the brain works, the parts of the brain that really are linked to possession light up oftentimes when, you know, if, if we like lust or we want something right, our brain naturally goes into like a possessiveness. And so the, the point is, is that we don't just run to things. We actually start to become possessive of things when we don't have like a father in our life. And that's just one way, right? That's just, there are many different ways that we run to things that um, at some point become a ruler, right? A, a real uh, God in our life. You become a Christian and tell me the story about reconnecting with your dad that I'm sure you've had some things you had to wrestle with internally about. Yeah. So again, what I didn't understand is the bitterness that was there. I didn't understand that piece the bitterness the resentment from my father not being there that's probably the first thing that some of the mature brothers in my my life re recognize they say well basically you're, you're bitter you don't you don't see it you don't feel it kind of like what you were saying earlier um the narrative that i had is i got this far without him mm. why do i need him now i remember saying that and then i have mature men in my life to say that's that's resentment you're wounded. You don't even know how wounded you are. Wow. And again, that trauma, right? I don't have conclusion for this wound. Um, and you live with a wound, it's probably going to kill you. And so what he had shared with me was two things are going to happen if you don't deal with this wound. It's going to destroy your relationship with God. And it's going to destroy whatever woman you, you the relationship with whoever you marry, it's going to destroy that relationship. And I'll never forget, see again, I mean, this is, I'm 37, so this is almost 20 years later, I still remember those words. And I've actually seen it, um, but I've, I've lived it. And I see, I see how, that, 
how true that was. There's an anger. I think there, that's part of the, real quick, the anger that is created when a father leaves is profound. It's deep. We're talking about a rage. And I think that that rage gets channeled somewhere. You know, we as men become driven or we become industrious or we become very, you know, focused on athletics. And we look for a way to kind of escape that, yeah. you know, narrative or complete it. Um, but what do we see? Every single time you can achieve, but it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, so go on, So the resentment, um, the, the, the piece that really wants, once things kind of got to a point where I needed to, where I really saw conclusion from my father was I was sitting with him. This was a, a pretty sure in college. Um, he came into town. He was over at my grandparents and it was him and I sitting in the car alone. And my dad, and we'll talk more about this, about different types of dads. Um, but my dad very much, you know, just that confrontation was really tough for him. You had to really almost corner my dad. And he's really matured since then. That's what partly I love sharing now is because my dad and I, we have a very different relationship now, but I basically trapped him in this car. And I was like, man, I got some questions and, and, and I, I need some answers and I'm, I'm serious. And I, I, I'm asking him a couple of questions. And one of the ones was I, I go, I've come up with one or two conclusions. Um, a, you didn't want me. I wasn't good enough and you needed to go get a new family. Because I wasn't good enough, my sister wasn't good enough, my mom wasn't good enough, and you didn't want to be with us. You didn't want to take care of me. You didn't want to take care of my sister. You want you want to be married to my mom. You didn't want us. We weren't good enough, mm -hmm. and so you went and got a family that was. B. You were really scared, mm -hmm. and you didn't know what to do. You and my mom weren't working out. Didn't know how to repair that. Didn't want me to maybe grow up in that didn't know what to do and probably never saw yourself in that situation, but it just kind of happened and things went on and this isn't what you wanted and I am worth it and you do love me, but this is how the story has unfolded. And he sat there and in my dad's own way, he goes, you know, Kyle, I think I like option B better. And again, we have to understand the way that, that dads learn, you know, men don't do hugs and ice cream. <laughs> we just, we don't learn that, you know what I mean? Like you're saying the more tender side and things. And um, that gave me a sense of conclusion. Again, the brain wants beginning, middle and end. But what's healthy is for it to get a functional ending, not an unrealistic one that says that didn't happen or it didn't hurt or it's not connected to reality. I'm talking about a functional conclusion, an adaptive conclusion is really the clinical term for it. And what that then allowed me to do is it, it really kind of gave a place for that rage. You know, again, rage is partly about confusion and a lack of clarity. And, and it just settled something in me to get that. Now, that's not always possible. But what I love is, is because I had great men in my life who challenged my resentment, I was able to get to that place where I could think in terms of, hey, there's probably a couple of different options I can offer to my dad as I have this conversation with him instead of just corner him and enrage him enough. Because that's the thing with my dad, if you if you rage out on him, he's likely gonna flee. It just it's that's overwhelming for him, right? So anyway, that that's part that that's that was a monumental conversation with my dad and really changed the story arc of our relationship. How difficult was it to be one that had to think adaptively in two words, like to get to know your dad and to create this um, scenario opportunity where you may not get exactly what you want. You may not hear the exact words you want, but to be okay and flexible. How hard is that? Love that question. That's where we have to discipline our disappointment. Mm -hmm. I mean, we typically, again, when you have that destructive entitlement, it's from a wound. It's, I, I deserve this. I'm going to get mine. Um, it's mind over matter. Uh, I don't mind and you don't matter. <laughs> I mean, we have to get to a place where our disappointment is, is, has some constraints to it. And having men in our life, I think, see, I had men in my life. 
I, look, and I'm going to be graphic here. I, I think, man, I, <laughs> I would have peed standing up or sitting down if I hadn't seen a man standing up. I mean, I would have sat down on a woman uh, on the toilet like a woman. Like you see, you see what I'm saying? Like we, you know, you need a man to walk you through it. You know, initiation is a team sport, and I had help. I mean, you know, uh, success leaves clues, and so does failure. And I just, I don't see how a man can can just figure that out. That's part of the wound. Are you we saying help. it's almost impossible? For a man, a young boy who's hurt, to heal without another man initiate him. Damn. You got me, man. What you got another one? I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, I. Wow. So, man, that's that's twofold. Because then, what it makes me think, me as a man, and what am I doing to help the community that does not have men involved in their lives? And then the other side is like, man. I'm, Think about all these young kids out here. I live in Chicago. Man, you, we're in the news all the time. Chirac for a reason. Um, but not just the black community, but all nationalities. Like, man, what is happening to these young kids? No, that's not happening to dad. So it's, and it's challenging to hear that it's almost impossible to heal without initiation. So how did you connect with God as a father? Because obviously, growing up as a, without a dad, I'm sure there were some difficulties there, some challenges. So then, like, if you, how do you connect with someone you can't see, someone you can't hear? How do you connect on that level? And that's the beauty of who God is. Um, God is so overwhelmingly on a different level. Like, he, he, knows, he knows how to take fatherlessness, you know, and create a relationship with him out of that. Like, that's pretty smart. Like, we have a pretty smart God. He knows how to create a yearning in someone instead of, um, instead of a, a resentment towards him, right? Because, I mean, I, I think for me, that's part of why I became a Christian is because I wanted a dad. I, I, that's why, and it was weird because my theology was kind of, I, I look at it now and I was like kind of off. Like, oh, Jesus, yeah, okay. But God, the father, I want that. Like, I was, I was, more, I was so into having a father. I didn't want anybody to leave me. Yeah. So what's your favorite story in the Bible or scripture that helps you see God as a father and connect with him on a relational level? I love that you say story. Let me use a word is uh, Abba, which is Aramaic for daddy. Um, that was the word that gripped me, that grabbed me. I mean, it's used like three times in the New Testament. It's, it's something that as I've talked to men in my church, it makes men feel uncomfortable because it's so intimate. Like it's a, I, but I remember grabbing that word really quickly when I, when I was a baby Christian is Abba. And I mean, it's a super like, to get, not to get too th theological, but it's a super intimate word because I mean, even when the translators were you know, thinking about how to translate it, it was kind of like, uh, do we use Abba? Cause it's, you're going to call upon, you know, Adonai, Elohim, like you would a, a daddy. I mean, it's kind of like if you're a king, it's what your kids would call you. But everyone else would say, you're, you know, your majesty, you know, um, your greatness. But to go to God and call him daddy, like you, you're not God. You're not of divine essence. Only Jesus is. But, but again, if you are a brother or a sister of Christ, you now have the, the rights of a firstborn. And we know Christ is the firstborn. So now you, so just that idea of um, that, that for me, it was Abba. It was daddy. You say to older men, as we discussed earlier, that it's almost impossible for young men to grow and heal without other older men initiating with them. What do you say to older men that feel like, hey, I'm scared to initiate with people that I know. I'm scared to connect with the community. What advice do you have for them? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm really, really curious about the fear. Is the fear overwhelmed? Is the fear I don't feel equipped because this person is a person of color and I'm not? Is the fear I have a schedule that is not gonna allow me to be in this person's life consistently? I have a fear about this person having needing a level of resources that I can't present. I have, I mean, what's the fear? Is it is it based in capacity? Is it based in I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Is it based in, I 
I'm not a great father myself, or was it based in I didn't get the, that from someone? I mean, it, it just, for men, it, it, there's a million reasons what that fear could be about. I want to know more about that. Dude, this excites me because that means, hey, there's a conclusion there. You've got to dig it out. What's that conclusion that you've made that mm -hmm. you need to change, you know, to find the truth, you know? So that's yeah. good. I didn't, I didn't even think about that. That's really good that you made that association. I oh, see. I'm trying to catch up to your level. You're on the master's level. Nah, I'm bro. To stick to what you've been teaching. Thanks for this time, I've got no other questions. Is, if there's, is there a, something, a plug, if people want to find you? So I'm starting a YouTube channel. It's called Truth Trauma Theology. Ooh. And uh, I'm going to be releasing on Facebook and YouTube a five-part series on trauma. And what it's going to go through and talk about is just the different parts about trauma and really apply it to what we got going on. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, but also I think the other thing is really is the, um, the piece where people are just asking a lot of questions right now in terms of race and culture and then the kingdom. And I'm going to be putting some content out on that as well. And dude, you owe me one or two, like I'm bringing you on and I have expectations, man. I'm bringing you on to my channel and we're going to rock it out, man. Whatever you need, man, I'm going to support. So Kyle, as I said before, man, you're a true treasure. I love who you are. I love what you do. I love what you're about, man. So nothing but success and blessings for you, man. I love you. And thank you so much for sharing your insights and wisdom. I love you, bro. And uh, I'm really excited, man, about the future. I am. The heart is deep. You're so unique. You got to find the truth underneath. So let's...